Funding for Current Conversations is provided by the University of Oklahoma President's Office, OU Outreach and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. Today, we are pleased to give you a preview of some shows that will air as a part of this season of Current Conversations. Our guests for this preview show will be Indigenous Administrator of Higher Education, Yvonne Peter, MTV personality and social commentator, Francesca Ramsey, social activist, Tim Wise, spoken word poet, Yasmin Watkins, and Indigenous policy analyst, Sadelta Oshui. We interview these guests on location at the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in Fort Worth, Texas. Stay with us and meet these engaged and exciting social activists. <laughs> was there an experience that happened to you as a child where you saw, well, I, I could do work like this, I, I could make a difference? Was there a role model? Maybe it was Wilma Mankiller. You know, where, do you, where did you draw the strength from? I think I just drew, I, from my family, my grandparents, um, they were just incredibly strong, resilient human beings. I mean, they're just incredible people. And that strength, I think, has kind of carried me through in different places and areas. Um, they all overcame so much. You know, my dad was one of eight. My mom was one of 11. My mom was in boarding school. My dad had to learn English when he went to the public school system. And so they all overcame so much. And they, my parents both went on to get college degrees. And so that was an expectation that was set for us. As a kid, I knew, I just assumed you go to high school, then you go to college, and then you get a job and you're done. And that was an incredible expectation set by my parents and my family. Um, but their strength and everything that they've overcome, I think, just kind of carried me through. Um, and it's been one of the, the greatest gifts that they've ever given me. You are a, somebody that works under, I would say, the umbrella of social justice mm -hmm. in a very important way. Mm -hmm. And to be somebody so uh, clear-minded and strong as you are, you have to work some of those things out so that you, you, know, you know what your own version of social justice is, what you're working toward. Would you share that with us? I mean, what, how, how do you think of social justice in relation to tribal world? Well, I think that, you know, social justice has become this kind of buzzword and a hashtag, and I'm not sure if everyone really is on the same page to think of, you know, what is social justice? Like, doesn't what does get, it actually mean? You know, get define it. No, no one, yeah. people really don't define no. it. Um, I think that I kind of have to laugh because I was thinking, you know, I think James Brown kind of said, I don't want you to give me nothing, open the door and I'll get it myself. And I kind of, the way I feel about social justice is like this recognition that doors are closed to people and how do we open them and let's open those doors. For tribal communities, we haven't had access to so many things and our, our voice hasn't been at the table or part of the conversation for so long. So it's a matter of being at the table and trying to be a, a reflection of that. But a lot of the work was educating people and reminding them tribes still exist, we're still here. We're different than other communities, and here's how, and you need to work with us differently. But the fact that we were there and able to communicate that and tell people that was so powerful, and it opened doors for people and, and communities. The question I'm going to ask now could be a whole other show, but I, I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> okay. You know, we, we could think about sort of the dual original sins of the United States as mm -hmm. slavery and Indian removal. Right. And, and, it, and it feels like maybe we get a little closer dealing with historical trauma with mm -hmm. slavery. It, um, the, the culture it doesn't seem to be very close to dealing with indigenous issues, mm -hmm. and um, they need to be dealt with. Right. Uh, why? I mean, it's never been a Supreme Court, indigenous Supreme Court justice, right. for example. Right. You can just go on with that right. list way, way down the list. Mm -hmm. um, why aren't we closer on that? It would just seem like to be a no-brainer. We need to right. talk about our past. We, it, it's true. Um, I think it's because we're just invisible. Um, part of it is the statistics. You know, we're such a small percentage of the population, and most people never have interactions with other tribal people. A lot of the times it's only through a mascot or some other kind of demeaning way that yeah. they have any kind of context point for native people. You know, we were at this screening last night, More Than a Word, it's an incredible documentary, and there was a Q&A after, and one of the, the people said, I just didn't know this was an issue. And my friend looked at me, she said, how do they not know this is an issue? <laughs> and I told her, I was like, because they don't, 
we live in a different universe. We, as a kid, I thought everyone was Native American. I mean, everyone's Indian. Because I grew up in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. <laughs> everyone in Tahlequah was Indian. They're all Cherokee. Uh, when I went up to North Dakota, I would pick up my aunt in Nebraska and my cousin, and they're Indian. And I have people in Minneapolis and Montana all over. We had family, and they're all Indian. So I just assumed we're all Indian, you know? And I remember as a kid, I was looking at a history book one summer because I was a nerd and I read all the time. And I was like, oh, population. It says we're less than 1%. That must be a typo. So I walked up to my mom. I was like, mom, it says 1%. And she was like, it's like, my mom doesn't know either. <laughs> like, she's wrong on this too, which is crazy. It wasn't until I left that I realized that that bubble that I lived in, and I think we have this social media bubble now because all of my friends are very active and they're, they have all these issues. They're always coming up on my timeline and my feed. But if you don't have anyone in your life that has that perspective, you don't see that story. And there are, you know, lots of folks um, who do that kind of work around issues of race uh, in this country. I'm certainly not alone in that. And I think those of us who do it would mostly agree that it is, um, it, it's the way that we have to do the work. You know, it's not that we, that it's not that we have a problem answering to people or having a normal job. You it's can't do it we, on email yeah. or a day, a day a month or yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's not a hobby. You know, it's not a side thing. It's really, we, we need to be out there meeting with people. And for me, you know, that's why I've stuck with it for so long, because even though it's very tiring and even though it doesn't have the same effect on the body at 48 that it did at 26, um, being in community, meeting people, finding out what they're doing in their communities around issues of race and trying to share ideas with them is sort of what gives me energy and, and keeps me um, in the work and, and really keeps me from getting burned out. Because I think if you don't have something that you really love about this work, it, it, you know, it's very, it can be crushing. I mean, there are a lot of issues in the country that we're dealing with that are obviously very daunting. And so you have to have that kind of release, I think. And it's hard to see the progress. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Um, I think a lot of people would put you as a worker for social justice in connection with race, sure. you know, it's kind of a general umbrella. Do you have a working definition for social justice that kind of drives you, the one that, you're, just your way of looking at it? I don't know that I have a, a working definition per se. I have a conception in my head of what I think of. Uh, you know, to me, social justice means the creation of a society where uh, delineations of race and gender and sexuality and class do not come with a clear division of opportunity and power. Uh, obviously, those divisions will exist, those terms will exist, those concepts will exist, but they should not correlate with who has more and who has less. There should be no necessary relationship between color of skin, between gender and the, you know what kinds of chromosomes you have, or what your uh, uh, religion is, for instance, or your sexuality, and the power, access, opportunity, resources that you, that you possess. So you're not talking about dis distribution of wealth, particularly, you're talking about uh, social access. Well, I think equity. part of it, I think wealth is part Part of it, uh, but but okay. wealth is one piece. You know, there there is access. There's also, to me, it's about the ability to to exercise self determination and autonomy. And I think the problem that we have in this country right now is that people who are working class and lower income, people who are of color, folks who are LGBTQ, women as women, are oftentimes not only have less wealth, but they also have less ability to exercise self-determination. Communities are not able, for instance, to decide who's going to teach their children uh, in schools where if you don't understand working class community and community of color, you're not going to you're not going to know how to relate to kids. They don't have the choice of who's going to police their streets. And so if you're in a lower income black community and all the cops are white and live in the suburbs and they have no connection to you and you don't have any way to control that, you don't get to choose who are the cops. Well, I was thinking that's or, a problem. Or control the quality of water in your community. Or like Flint. Right. I mean, you don't have the ability to determine where your water is going to come from, if you're going to have food deserts or access to healthy nutrition. So to me, wealth is a piece of it because wealth will or access to money will help you do those things better. But it's also about who controls the decisions. And I think we have to really think about ways to put more power in the hands of local communities and individuals um, rather than uh, simply thinking of it as a money thing. It's also about who decides, who decides, who teaches, who decides, who polices, that kind of thing. To be somebody who has given his life to thinking about these issues and articulating them for other people and really being kind of a leader, I think it's what people used to call a, a calling, you know, in a, in a religious context. Was there a moment in your education or growing up, uh, uh, a clarifying, crystallizing experience or a role model, somebody who, or some situation that conveyed to you, yes, uh, th things could be changed. Yes, I could make a difference. Yes, this could be me who does this work. I don't know that there were moments that told me that I could necessarily make a difference, um, but I certainly know that there were a number of moments along the way that 
raised my awareness of the problem. Um, you know, I went to preschool at a historically black college, so most of my early childhood friends in, you know, pre-kindergarten were black kids. Most of the teachers, the authority figures were black women, so that when I got into elementary school in Nashville, Tennessee, I was able to maybe see some things in terms of the way people were being treated that a lot of white kids maybe would not. Um, Obama's Other Daughters is an all-black, all-female improv team. Um, we all took classes at UCB individually. And UCB um, is? Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. It's a huge improv uh, conglomerate. Um, like, Amy Poehler founded it. Aziz Ansari came out of it. Like, the Broad City Girls. Um, there, it's just, like, it's a huge improv training, like, space for a lot of like comedians. And so we were all taking classes there. And uh, one of our members was like, hey, you guys want to like get together and like play and like practice. And that practice group turned into this like group where we do workshops and performances. And um, it was really cool because this one girl was applying for the diversity scholarship. And the person who runs the program came up to us and she's like, she referenced you guys as a point of entry. She's like, I didn't know that black girls, that like we could do improv or that we were welcome there. I wasn't interested in improv until I saw you guys perform. And it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a funny concept right from the beginning. Obama's other daughters. <laughs> and then four of you, right? And you, five and you, of us. Five yeah. of you. And you're, you're improvisational. And you tour the country, mm -hmm. and you're showing up at conferences and theaters, I guess, or uh, how would you describe where you're at? Yeah, so we do a lot of shows in L.A. Uh -huh. um, I think we have a show almost every week uh, from UCB to Second City, um, Iowa West, a lot of, like, indie improv spaces. We're going to DCM, which is the Del Close Marathon, um, which is a huge, like, improv festival. Mm -hmm. So we do festivals as well. Um, and this is, I've seen you all. I saw you today. And you're very funny. I'm just, it's just <laughs> really awesome. But there's social commentary, too, right? Yeah, and I think that's, like, the biggest part of what I want communicated in the art I do, whether it's poetry or acting or anything, is that I, like, I want to entertain, but then, like, slide in the message. So I call it, like, edutainment, um, where, like, I'll spit a poem, and maybe someone isn't going to show up to a Black Lives Matter meeting or action that we have planned, but they'll hear about Waukesha Wilson, who was killed in police custody through the poem, right? Yeah. Or they'll hear about the boys that I work with in prison. I like volunteer sometimes with uh, incarcerated youth and like doing poetry workshops with them. And I think often their their voices are not heard um, and they're like thrown thrown away folks. And so even if they're not coming to the prison with me, they are hearing about their story in my poetry, in the poetry that I'm able to share of theirs that they write and like that I help. What a scary concept, uh, thrown away folks. You know, that's that's yeah. I mean, that is what it's our the truth. prison yeah, system it's the truth. is. You know, I, I'm hearing this from what you're doing. <laughs> the idea from several people, uh, Kamal Bell. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, does wonderful work. I think on the United States of uh, America. And, but there's a lot of comedy to it. So that he, I think, puts people at ease. Sometimes people say terrible things, but he comes back and recontextualizes it in a comic way. And um, Francesca Ramsey, I think, yeah. uses comedy. Incredible You're talking way. about the same thing. Uh, that's that's got to be kind of a new approach, I guess, really. Sort of getting people involved in things that otherwise, who say things that otherwise could be conversation stoppers. Well, about and race and absolutely. Class I and mean, it can be scary to like talk about these topics with your friends, your partners, your like lover, whoever. Like, it can be yeah. terrifying. But I think when you bring someone to a show, or even like an Uber driver here in like Fort Worth, Texas, is like, "Hey, why are you here?" And I'm like, "Well, National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in American Higher Education. I'm you know performing, doing poetry, doing workshops around improv and all of that. And so it's like." They can't not engage, right? Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. The history in Alaska is very similar to the history in, in the continental United States mm -hmm. with colonization, um, assimilation policies. Um, you know, my, my grandparents, for example, weren't even citizens in our own homeland. And I grew up with my grandfather in my village, so this is not a long ago history mm -hmm. in, in my experience. And my mother uh, grew up during the boarding school era, was sent off, um, you know, basically being forced to give up who she is, her language, her identity, um, as a part of that uh, 
forced assimilation process. And so we suffered a lot of the same discrimination, uh, segregation. We had segregated schools. Native people weren't allowed to shop in stores, own businesses. And so naturally, the university was not a welcoming place. Wait, say the last part again. Uh, people weren't allowed to shop. What? Shop in stores. You know, there there were there were signs and doors that would read "No dogs, no natives," for example. Wow. Um, wow. And this, so, what were they supposed to do? To to buy goods, get somebody to shop are, for them, or something. Are likely. Uh, you know, there were some stores that would allow native people. You know, just like I think in in probably similar to some of the history, um, you know, in, in the, again, in the continental United States, there were always some people within every society who understood the injustice and inequity in, in the situation that existed. And my dad was from Mexico. Yeah. And, and of course, in the South, the white only uh, restaurants and bathrooms and, or no Mexicans allowed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so we had that same uh, historical experience. And, and so, and so then the university too itself naturally, because it was made and founded based by on the same um, settlers who are coming into Alaska uh, were exclusionary to Alaska Native people. And it really wasn't until um, maybe, uh, you know, one or two slipped through the cracks into the institution uh, early on. Uh, but it, it really wasn't until I would say the 1980s that uh, maybe the late 70s that the institution started to, to um, become more responsive to the fact that they are on indigenous lands and that our indigenous peoples are here, we're here to stay. And um, they had to find a way um, to begin to change the culture of the institution to be more accepting and welcoming of Alaska Native people. Um, but in large part, that was due to the political power that we were starting to manifest you know, through the 60s and 70s. I, I was going to ask what, what happened to change that. I think a lot of people hearing this for the first time, maybe they don't know anything about Alaska universities, would just assume that there are administrators there who can understand the uh, issues uh, of the students actually at the university, which would be, it seems to be a no-brainer that you should be there, somebody like you. So that wasn't the case. So w no. what was the pressure that brought you in or another well, indigenous administrator? I, I have to honor the legacy of indigenous leaders before me that really paved the way for Alaska Native people to have a place and a space within the institution at, at an administrative faculty and student level. And mm -hmm. so I'm certainly, I'm the second Alaska Native person to serve as, as a vice chancellor at the university. The first was the late Bernice Joseph, who um, passed away very young. And she was actually on my graduate committee. Mm -hmm. She was one of my first bosses when I moved out of the village as a teenager to the city. And so um, I had known her for a long time, but she was one of the champions of pushing her way into the system and saying, look, um, Alaska Native people should have a, a high place in the institution, be able to be a part of the decision makers who really determine how we move forward with our mission as an institution. And, um, and so I have to acknowledge some of those early forebears before me in, in, that, in that work. But what had happened is there, there was a, you know, a major civil rights movement. You know, I, I, couldn't, I put it into a 100-year-plus context for our Alaska people to work towards having a right to citizenship, right to vote, uh, having a right to own land in our own land. Um, right to uh, vote. Yeah. So when did that happen? What's the uh, similar to all the American Indian people, Native Americans in, in the continental U.S., the 1924 Indian mm -hmm. um, Citizenship Act also applied to Alaska Native people. Mm -hmm. So in 1924, um, but then we had the Jim Crow laws up there, just just like down here, where we we're you know we're excluded from being able to vote. Actually, prior to 1924, in Southeast Alaska, where they had some of the longest contact with settler um, communities and people. Uh, they, they had to turn in a process to get citizenship and a vote for some Native people, but they had to have something like, I should have researched this before this interview, but something like eight non-Native people to declare that you are civilized and you had to give up your language, your identity, and you had to sign on a document saying you're no longer Native mm -hmm. in, in order to be able to, to vote. Um, and very few people, of course, went through that process uh, prior to the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act. Can, can you give an example of maybe something that, that you did on the show 
recently that worked especially well and you got a very good response where, where you were kind of dissecting the layers of something or giving the real racial content of something? Um, so this season, we've actually really been expanding to talk about things outside of racial identity, just okay. so that we can try and reach as many people as possible. Um, and our most recent episode for Mental Health Awareness Month was talking about the stigmas surrounding mental health. And again, we like to use pop culture references. So we talked about how often in movies, oftentimes the killer has some sort of mental illness, which perpetuates the stigma that if you're mentally ill, you're more violent. When in reality, if you have a mental illness, you have a higher chance of succumbing to violence at the hands of someone else or hurting yourself. Interesting. Um, and so we got a lot of messages from people who said, oh my goodness, you know, I have suffered with depression or anxiety and my family doesn't understand. And I can use this video as a jumping off point to say, look, I'm glad that you love me, but love is not going to help me get through my mental illness. Right. Um, and so we really just try to put it in plain English. And again, using those pop culture references, whether it's 13 Reasons Why or Psycho or, um, you know, M. Night Shyamalan has a new movie, Split, which is about split personalities. I love his work. Um, I mean, people are really influenced by these things and they don't realize how powerful it is to see these depictions of people with mental illness. And then when you have a friend or family member with mental illness, you might not be as sensitive or understanding because you have this negative or limited perception that's been based on media and pop culture. Now, if people uh, watch Decoded, are they gonna see you looking at a camera and yeah. a lot of graphics or... Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So it's me straight to camera. We do a mix. So sometimes we do sketches um, where it's me out in the world doing character-based stuff or um, out on the street interviewing people. But a lot of times it's me straight in the studio looking right into the camera, uh, answering questions that people might have with lots of different graphics um, and, you know, cutaways and jokes and things like that. With a, and, and your demographic is a lot of young people, probably. I mean, we do. 18 to 30 I would or, say that like the largest part of our audience is that eighteen to thirty-four, which is like the millennial sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, but it is really cool when I get comments from people that say like, "I'm in my fifties and I love Decoded," and I'm just like, "Yay, this is so great." Um, we want to appeal to everybody, but because we are a web series, you know, um, we do really well on Facebook. We do really well on Snapchat. There's a lot of young people on those platforms. Um, and so I'm glad that it's resonating with them. To do something as ambitious as this and as successful as this, you must have a pretty good orientation, your own sense of what you think of as social justice, something that you work out of, maybe just your own pet theory. Could you share that with us? I mean, how do you think about social justice, maybe in relation to your show? Yeah, I mean, for me, social justice is really about making sure that we live in a world that treats everybody fairly and gives everyone the same opportunities, no matter what their race, gender, sexuality, physical ability, uh, mental health is, and that they can be their best and most authentic true selves. Um, and unfortunately, we don't live in that world just yet. So um, that is why it's important for us to have the type of conversations that are happening here at Encore, the types of conversations that are happening on Decoded, um, so people can start doing the work personally and then within their own community. Oh, I think you're modeling that attitude. It's just uh, amazing. Was there a moment in your education, in your childhood, where you realized, uh, yeah, I could make a difference. I could do this kind of work. That, that sometimes is academic or sometimes out of people's reach, but I could go right to young people and speak to them directly and advance the good, you know, make it a little bit better world. So I, a role model I had been on YouTube for about six years um, doing beauty videos, hair, um, comedy sketches, characters, and in 2012, I had a viral video called Stuff White Girls Say to Black Girls, um, and it got about a million views in one day, mm -hmm. and it, I think, got about five or six in a week, and I got uh, interviewed by Anderson Cooper, I was on CNN, I was on MSNBC, I was on NPR, I was everywhere, and I realized, holy crap, I started a conversation accidentally <laughs> that clearly needed to be had. Um, and so I really, from that moment, tried to pivot my content to really start talking about more social issues in a comedic way, because it's something I had dabbled in. I had talked about uh, safe sex, getting tested for HIV, uh, student loan debt. Like I had talked about big issues in comedic ways, um, but I realized, oh, I'm kind of onto something when it comes to talking about race. Um, I never anticipated it would turn into a show, 
but you're that good was the at dream. It. You're good <laughs> you know, at it and I'm, it's needed. Well, yeah. and I'm very fortunate, and I think that that's something that's so cool about social media and YouTube specifically, is that now the gates, the gatekeepers are kind of gone. If you have a voice or if you have a message, if you have a story to tell, um, social media is a place that you can do it and it can turn into a book or a TV show or a movie. Um, and there are just so many cool people that are using the platforms in that way. And I'm, I'm really fortunate that I'm one of them as well. In, in the area of news, it seems like a bad thing that the gatekeepers are gone because oh, yeah, of fake people, news, et cetera. Absolutely. But, but in but your also, world. But at, at the yeah. same time, you know, you saw things like what happened in Ferguson. There were lots of people who were on the ground reporting yeah. on Twitter, live streaming things that, you know, mainstream media was not covering, where no. they were giving, you know, a very limited perspective, whether it was tear gas or tanks or whatever. And we saw people using Twitter to say, no, this is actually what's happening. So I do think there are always going to be people who abuse whatever medium is out there. But at the same time, there are a lot of people that are pushing boundaries and using them in creative ways to educate and reach lots of people. The, the example that I just I find so unspeakable is Flint, where right. basically an atrocity was happening over 20 years, and right. you know nobody. Uh, and did social about media it. has really continued yeah. to keep Flint in the spotlight. You know, I think unfortunately there is so much going on, and and. They're not as top of mind as they should be. Um, but most recently, I did hear about a woman who was using, you know, her own company to kind of go in and rebuild um, some of those pipes. And I really think that the push on social media helped get more people involved, whether it was donating water or, you know, giving people places to stay uh, in and around the Flint area. Um, who didn't have access to clean water. And so, you know, that's super powerful. Public betrayal on that level, it's just, it's just mind-boggling, et cetera. So many people who work with the issues that you address or any kind of social activism speak about the last 10 years as being a kind of turn away from maybe what they thought was going to be faster progress. I think a lot of people thought there would be racial equity a little bit faster. And it's, it feels like a dark time over the last 10 years. Do you feel that? Are you disappointed at where we are Right now, and I mean, I think we have made progress, but I also think we still have a long way to go. And in many ways, I feel like post Obama's presidency, there's been kind of a pendulum swing. I think yeah. a lot of people, there was a lot of progress, you know, with, with same sex marriage, for example. Um, and I think a lot of people felt uncomfortable as if it was maybe happening too fast or they weren't yeah. ready for all of these changes. And so I think what we're seeing is a lot of people who felt as if their world was changing and issues were not being focused on them and there were too many people that didn't look like them that were being on television and getting special treatment, mm -hmm. um, you're seeing a pushback for that. Yeah. And I think, you know, as, as heartbreaking as it is, for me, it just inspires me to work harder and lets me know that my work is really important and is needed and that there has to be a shift in how we talk about these issues because, unfortunately, too many people are misunderstanding them or are feeling guilty or are feeling angry uh, when what we really need is for people to have a little bit more empathy for people that aren't like them. That's all we have time for today. Please find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you so much for being a part of today's show. Join us next time for more Current Conversations.